Well, last week I challenged you with the open hands and to really look at letting things go. And we talked about giving God the freedom to give and to take away as he sees fit. And this week, what we're going to do is talk about when I can get away from clenching and I really have that open sense about what God has given me, that I can go deeper in my walk with him, specifically as we look at present circumstances. What is happening in your life right now? Because see, when we have open palms and we're really seeing God in the, in the right light that he gives and he takes away, it is all his. Then as we're going through the things that are happening in our life, we can begin to ask ourselves questions that will take us deeper in our walk with the Lord. Questions like, do I like this? Does it make sense to me? Why has God put this in my life? Or why has God removed it? from my life. Ultimately, God has a plan and a purpose for every single thing he does in your life. Everything is divinely ordered by him. And whether or not we want to embrace that truth, it is truth. He controls it all. And as I was saying, his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. And what does that mean? That our life is riddled with uncertainty. I love the word riddle. God's the one who brought that to my mind. When you're trying to solve a riddle, the idea is to, you're trying to figure it out, right? Well, our lives are riddled with uncertainty because we are not God. So how do we find meaning As we are working through the riddles that inevitably come into our life, that sense of uncertainty. And that is the title of our lesson. We find meaning by turning to God. So if you look at your first section there, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes 3 and 4 today. And in our first section, we're going to turn to God because He cycles time. 3, 1 through 8. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Who has heard this part of scripture before, whether you've ever studied Ecclesiastes or not? If nothing else, you heard it in song by the birds because they released these scriptures. They, they didn't get it right on the very last one. I just want to point that out. But this, is, um, this has been a very popular um, section of scripture. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. In this first section, these first eight verses, your letter A, my life in total view. It is significant that there are 28 statements there, 14 couplets, and they are all opposite. It's a very, what I learned, is a very well-known usage of literature in Scripture. And I I won't take you into all of the issues there, but let me just give you a couple of things. Activity. That word activity in verse 1 literally means desire, a deliberate, willful act. And of course, season is the duration of that. And so we have here then some opposites. Now, if you write in your Bible, I found this very helpful to break apart these eight um, verses. Two and three, those are two verses that I bracketed. A time to be born, a time to die. Those four couplets there, those four opposites, have everything to do with physical life. From beginning to end, born, die, plant, uproot, kill, heal, tear down, build. Beginning to end physical life. Now, oftentimes, people want to, we like the positives in here. We like being born, we don't like being died. We like planting, we don't really like uprooting, especially when God is trying to uproot something in our life. We don't like the idea of kill 
but we like the idea of heal. So I, I want to just pause here and make a very important point. According to God's plan, there is a time for everything, a season for every activity. Let's take the point of kill. Do you know that in each one of your bodies, unless you have a genetic defect, God has implanted in you the ability of the body to assess cells and how well they are operating. And if they are not operating appropriately, your genetic makeup says to the body, go to that cell and kill it. And do you know there's a genetic defect called La Farmini syndrome that specifically inhibit the body is not able to go and kill cells, specifically cancer cells, that need to be killed. Can I get a witness? We're glad that God gave the body ability to kill. So we need to make sure that we look at God's word and understand that we don't just try to apply it the way that the world would suggest that we apply it. Everything, there, for everything there is a time. Okay, verse 4, those two couplets, weep and laugh, mourn and dance. It's simply our response, our emotional life as it relates to what we experience in two, verses 2 and 3. So what is our response to verses 2 and 3? That's part of our emotional life. Verses 5 and 6. This has to do with my affection for people and my interest in things. My affection for people and my interest in things. That's verses 5 and 6. I wish I had time to just, just really unpack every single one of those. Um, but that's, it has to do with my affection for people and my interest in things. Verse 7 stands alone. It has to do with mourning. Specifically, in the um, Hebrew culture, when they were in mourning, it was very, they would tear their garments. And they would be in silence during their time of mourning. So that's the idea of tearing. And then when mourning is over, we mend. And that there is a time to be silent. And there is a time to speak. And then verse 8 a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. These look at things I can control and things I cannot control. I can control the giving of love. I can control hating. I cannot control war and peace. And so, that again, what he is saying here is every single thing in my life is in total view of God. And he's covering it all. So my life in total view. Look at letter B. My work in total view. Verse 9. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. I'm going to pause right there. Solomon is asking, really, what is the point of work? Why, why, why would I work? And it applies to all work. And so a couple of things I want to point out here. Your work can become a burden. If you are so busy working that you never take the time to actually enjoy what God has given you to do, we have to see all work as a gift of God. And so we need to take time to enjoy it. By the way, your work can be beautiful. God has given it to you for a purpose. And so consider it a gift. Listen to this. Nothing about my work is random or godless. It is precisely aligned and God-ordained. It is not the most important work that's meaningless. It's that the most trivial things that we do have great meaning. Most, really, our work should bring honor and glory to God. So that's my work in total view. Let's finish out verse 11 to get to see. It says that God has made beautiful everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. We could talk 45 minutes on that one verse. <laughs> Okay, I'm just telling you. I, I love it. I've loved studying it. Let me give you some things about letter B, or sorry, letter C, God's work in total view. God's work in total view. Specifically, God's purpose is clear. He has linked us with him by placing eternity in our hearts. He's linked us with him by placing eternity in our hearts. God's void. It's God's void. 
It is not a void that can be filled by Steph. It is not a void that can be filled by your husband. It is not a void that will be filled by your children. It is not a void that will be filled by your service in the church. It is God's void. No one, nothing can satisfy it. And by the way, for those of you who are petrified about witnessing, something that I read um, as I was setting this, I loved it. They said, do you know... Everyone, we all, we all share it in common, a void in our life that God has given us. If as you're listening to people, you will find their connection to that, to God, that, that eternity that has been set in their heart, and you connect the dots in their life about how God is the only thing that can fill that sense of longing in their life, you will have many opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It is not about following a formula. It doesn't have to be that way. The words don't have to be perfect. It's called listening to what they're saying. You will begin to hear in their words and the things that they say, a longing because God has placed eternity in their hearts. God's program, by the way, is mysterious. That's another thing in this section. Men cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. We can't explain everything in our life. We can't and we won't figure it out. I mean, I say all the time, I would just love the five-year plan. Just give me the five-year plan, God, and I'll know what I want to do. You know, and just mark it all out for me. It does not work that way. Anybody can relate? Okay. So we cannot figure it out. His program is mysterious. And lastly, God's time is not our time. We cannot fathom what he has done from beginning to end. And that is specifically why I wanted us to sing that hymn. We will understand it better by and by. There are things in our life right now that God never intended, nor does he intend for us to understand right now. But we will understand it better by and by. Let's look at letter D, our mission in total view. Verse 12, I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live. That everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil, this is a gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. <sighs> nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Whatever it has already been and what will be has been before and God will call the past to account. So three things I want to give you about our mission. One, we need to be thankful. We need to be thankful. We might not understand it, but we need to be thankful for it. And by the way, I am not saying, don't worry, be happy kind of philosophy that you hear out there. No, don't worry, be happy is let's just have faith in faith. No, we need to place our faith in God. We can rest assured because God is in control. See, your faith is only as good as the object of your faith. Now, if your faith is placed in Jesus Christ, then the object of your faith, the creator of the world, who ordains all things, who puts all things in motion, then your faith, there is no end to the faith that you can express of our Lord. So we need to be thankful for what God brings into and takes out of our life. Secondly, we need to be satisfied. Be satisfied. So everything is a gift. So how do we find satisfaction and meaning? Remember that the bubbles from last week? Are you with me? Remember the bubbles from last week? Okay, I'm just making sure. The whole idea is you're trying to grasp them, catch them, and when you got it, there was nothing there. If we want to get involved and have meaning, we need to be grasping a hold of what God is doing. That is where we will find meaning because everything that God does endures forever. Remember, lay up for yourself not treasures here on earth, but lay up your, for yourself treasures in heaven. Get on board with what God is doing. And thirdly, that leads me to the third point here in our mission. Be available. We said be thankful, be satisfied, be available. Ladies, God, look at that last phrase in 15. God will call the past to account. 
what you do with your time. He is going to ask us to account for how we spent our time. And so we need to get... We need to get beyond our worries, our lack of ability, our sense of inadequacy. That It has nothing to do with that. God will qualify those he desires to be used in his kingdom. We don't have to make ourselves ready. That's God's job. So we need to get beyond that. And we need to understand that he, he gives us that sense of inadequacy so that we revere him. Respect. That's what that word means. So I'm reminded every time I go to start a study and I think, oh my goodness, what have I done to myself? I've not gone to school. I've not had formal training on this. Praise God for great mentors. What have I gotten myself into? Now, that sense that comes into the pit of my stomach when I get ready to start is to remind me that it's not about Elizabeth. It is about what God is going to do. And it makes me so dependent on him. And that's what he desires to do in your life too. Whatever it is. So as you consider these scriptures, your life in total view, your work in total view, God's work in total view, and our mission in total view, that gives us our truth. What we do with our time matters to God. What we do with our time matters to God. And I learned that in 2008. In January, Fred's mom, his stepmom of 30 years, died. Of course, you all, if you come to church here, you know in May that Pastor Pollock died. In August, Simeon died. And in December, a dear friend of Fred and I since high school died of breast cancer after battling it for four years. And I will tell you so vividly, when after, leading up to Thanksgiving and Heather and I talking and, and um, really understanding, by the way, she's the one who has that La Framini syndrome. And as we were talking, and I could tell that she was declining quickly, when her husband called me on the first Saturday of December and said, you need to come, and we dropped everything, I took a friend, we drove up, and I arrived on a Sunday at 11 o'clock. And I remember walking in, and there were a lot of people there from her church, her father was there. And I remember thinking, wow. Because I could see the horror on their face of, of how quickly she had declined in the shape of her body, and the difficulty eating, and yet, she was still trying to interact and remember names because the ammonia to just toxifying her body. And <laughs> sitting with her around the toilet as she was just sick, trying to still take medicine, and it would prolong her life one day. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, I'm trying to get over the fact that I'm this close to the toilet. But listening to what she's saying. And the next morning, um, by this point, she, she would not get up out of bed again. She, um, really, she just had snatches of consciousness where she would say things. And as I sat there just spending time with her, I, I figured, let me open my Bible to what I'm working on for this study. And it was chapter 3. There is a time for everything. A season for every activity, a time to be born, and a time to die. And I left there imprinted in my mind that what we do with our time matters. Because we are not promised tomorrow. What we do with our time matters. Everything is a gift of God, life and death. So what about you? How are you using your time? Do you have a sense of urgency? Do you need to reevaluate what you're doing and agree with God to be available for what He desires to do with your time? God cycles time. And He also, in section two, we've got to turn to God because He sees oppression. So we, we look here. In chapter 3, 
And I'm just going to take you right to verse 16. It says, And I saw something else under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness, in the place of justice, wickedness. And I thought in my heart, God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time for every deed. So look at letter A, the oppression of injustice. God sees it. Solomon saw it, and he was referring to that wickedness. Literally, this passage of Scripture, just so you know, refers to the wickedness in the court system that was present in Solomon's day. And that wickedness had taken the place of doing what is right. Wow, does that sound familiar? Think Scripture applies to today? Remember, though, look at this. I love verse 17. God will bring to judgment. Ladies, he is the ancient of days. He has always been on the throne. He will always be on the throne. There is not a single thing that escapes his notice. And he will right all wrongs. So God sees the oppression of injustice. Then secondly, he sees the oppression of death. So now we have this interesting, I know when you all read it, you were like, what? I thought as for men, God test them so that they may see that they are like the animals. I know you all enjoyed that. Man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. Can you just hear him and his meaninglessness? All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. I, I would tend to disagree. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust. All, um, and, and to the dust all return. Who knows if the spirit of the man rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into earth and then conclusion two. So I saw that there is nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work because that is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? So the oppression of death. Okay, what's the point now? I'm going to break this down simply and quickly. His point here is, remember, Solomon was looking under the sun and he wasn't taking into account God's perspective. I want to remind you of that. He's saying, in a physical sense, both man and animal do die. Right? We all, we all will lose breath. We will all, at some point, die. And we will all, well, not all animals are buried, but, you know, we return to the dust. If the animal doesn't get buried, well, you know, the, the, the critters come out and eat them up. And it's, he still gets returned to the dust. Okay? So he's saying here, in a physical sense, both have a physical death. But here's how they are different. What Solomon doesn't say in this particular passage of Scripture, but he has already said in verse 11. The difference between man and animal, God has placed eternity in the heart of man, not in that of animal. That eternity is set. By the way, man is made in God's image, not animal. There's another difference for you. And thirdly, man faces judgment, not the animals. So there are differences, ladies. Solomon might not have stated them all in this little section of Scripture, but they are there. So just so that we can demystify animals and people, God does not treat or see the same. So that's important that we bring that up. And what I wanna, how I want to pull us out of this is we need to not focus on on the uncertainty of death. And that's what Solomon tries to bring us to. We gotta win. He's encouraging us. Enjoy the life that God has given you. That's what he's saying there for man to enjoy the life that God has given you. Have faith to live with what seems like inconsistencies and absurdities because you are living on promises, not explanations. There are things in our life that we cannot understand. Heather's battle with cancer. She lost her first daughter at eight to cancer. Same genetic defect we found out later. Her own battle, her mother and her grandmother also died of cancer. There are things I don't understand. But, that, but if I could dwell on it, I could be consumed on it, and I could look for the explanations. But you know what? My life will become meaningless in the process. God is looking for us to rely on his promises. The third oppression is the oppression of the poor. The oppression of the poor. Go to chapter 4. Again, I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors. And they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. 
but better than both is he who has not yet been and who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. So he's looking at the oppression of the poor. A couple of things. Poor and rich. I'm just going to, let's say with money, without money. People who are without money, who, who might be labeled poor, there in no way can they stand up to the oppression that can occur. And what he's saying here literally is that those who have money can, we, can grease the wheels of the justice system. And the poor have no recourse because they don't have the money to do that or the assets to do that, as we would say in our current terms. And he's saying the poor have no comfort. Or notice how in one verse he repeats it twice. That is, ladies, anytime something is repeated, it's significant. Solomon is saying, I mean, he's just expressing the severity of where they are in their oppression. And this whole idea of better to, be bo um, to not be born... What he's giving us here is a picture of how bothered he is by what he has seen under the sun. He is bothered by it. Bothered by it. But remember, he was not looking at God's perspective. And I want to, you know, you all in your um, homework, if you didn't go there, I'm going to take us there in Second, um, sorry, First Thessalonians, no, Second Thessalonians, I had it right, chapter 1. We had you look that up, 5 through 10. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. As a result, you will be counted worthy for that which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who have to trouble you. He will give you relief when you are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Verse 8, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. A couple of things I want to point out. We can live with suffering because we can trust that God will not only be glorified in our suffering, but that he will make things right. And that we can expect relief. When we are suffering, we can expect relief. Any time that I spoke with Heather as she was going to the treatment, one of the things we would always do when we ended our conversations would be to remind ourselves whether you are healed right now in this life or you are healed beyond death, you will be healed. And we have to remind ourselves of that. And by the way, if nothing else, may that first that, that second Thessalonians verse give you a sense of urgency. For sharing the hope that you have with a lost and dying generation of people who do not know Jesus Christ. Or they think they know him. And they do not. They will be shut out from the presence. Let that fall on you and give you an urgency. And then let's look at letter D. The oppression of of obsession the oppression of obsession verse 4 and I saw that all labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor this too is meaningless the fool folds his hands and he ruins himself better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind let's look at obsession obsession with working all labor springs from man's envy of his neighbor. I was talking with a friend yesterday, and you know that phrase that was popularized? I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses. Do you know that we're all Joneses now? I'm not kidding. We're all Joneses now. It's all, I got to have this because so-and-so has this, and if it's not what they have, then I need to... You know, further deepen my spiritual walk because I see her and I listen to her and I feel like I'm inadequate, so I need to, I need to get into the Word so I can further deepen my spiritual walk. And we're, we're, our, our motivation is our motivation envy. So obsession with working. We've got to examine our motive. What is our motive? It doesn't mean that working hard is bad. What is our motive for working hard? Are we coveting? Are we competing to be first? Are we envying what others have? If we are doing those things, we will have no time to enjoy what we get for our hard work. And that's what Solomon was saying to us. 
Also, there was an obsession with laziness. That's verse 5. The fool folds his hands and ruins himself. I love this. Listen to this sentence. It is a slow, comfortable path towards self-destruction. Do you know that that phrase, ruins himself, literally translated means eats his own flesh. How's that for a picture? Laziness. Slow pathway to destruction. And then finally, we've got to look at, rather than being obsessed, we need balance. Now I have to tell you, this really speaks to me. Put your hands up like this. See, when I was in, when I taught science, um, because we didn't have balances for everybody, I would always have them hold their hands up and we would talk about weights and balances and, and, and addressing those things. So let me, just with this in mind, I want you to look at what he says. He says, better one handful with tranquility than two with toil. Two handfuls of toil. So here's what we need to work on. We need to work on balance in our life. Balance in our life. So as you're looking at your hands, think about these things. One hand, we're working. That's toil. One hand, rest. One hand, we are competing. One hand, we are cooperating. We need balance in our lives, ladies. So we've looked at the oppression of injustice, death, poor and obsession and Paul the Apostle Paul was well acquainted with every single one of those as a matter of fact in Philippians 411 I loved it when I looked it up it says I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry whether living in plenty or in want I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Turn to your neighbor and say, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You see, Paul, Paul, by the way, I encourage you, you probably just, did you see what just happened? You said it and there was a, there was an increase. In energy, there was an increase of something within you. Speak the word of God out loud. Hear yourself say it. Because you see, Paul was not looking for explanations for all that he had, was, was, had endured. He was clinging to the promises of God. And that leads me to our second truth. Sufficient grace. Sufficient grace comes with sufficient faith. Sufficient grace comes with sufficient faith. How I learned that was journeying with Heather at each step. And the closer that the seeming inevitability of death, as it, as it grew closer... I was able to observe, whether it be through talking with her, when we were together, I observed a giving of God's grace in death. Not before she needed it. You know, I just bought plane tickets. You know, I don't carry the plane tickets around with me because the event's not until the end of April. I pick up the plane tickets when I need them. In the same way, God gives you what you need at the moment that you need it. And in the process of being able to receive it, I need to have sufficient faith. Claiming the promises of God, not looking for explanations. What about you? What oppression are you facing right now? That God is asking you to have faith in His promises. Rather than looking for explanations, choose to cling to the promises of God. He is true to his word, ladies. Let's look at section three. Turn to God. He gives companionship and advancement. Verse seven of chapter four. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless, a miserable business. 
God desires to have relationship with each of us individually. He, by the, he also desires for our life to be filled with meaningful relationships of the people in, that he's surrounded us with now. So let's look at some things about companionship and advancement because we've got to make some wise choices in these two areas. Letter A, unbalanced living leads to loneliness. Unbalanced living leads to loneliness. This gentleman, this person that Solomon was talking about in 7 and 8, was laboring alone. Never content. Never taking time to enjoy what he was doing. And dare I say, not sharing it with the people around him. Remember balance that we just did from the previous section? See, if we are working to achieve, then the relationships in our life, if we, if we work to achieve and we ignore the relationships in our life, we will find a chasm develops between the two and we will suffer and our relationships will suffer. So we need to have a balance in our life if we are to have meaning, meaning in our lives. A couple of just quick practical things about balance in your living. For those of you who are married, something that you can do that helps to cultivate relationship with your spouse. Do you know that your spouse is energized by shoulder to shoulder friendship? You know how when you were dating, it's say, let's say he played baseball. You know, you would go to the game, maybe you hate baseball, but you would go to the game because you wanted him to see you there and you were supporting and you were cheering and woohoo, whatever it is that you did. But he was energized by that. And something happens. We get married and we think, well, you love me. I got the ring. I don't, I don't like baseball. I'm not going to watch it anymore. But you know what? He is energized. You cultivate relationship when you stand shoulder to shoulder or you sit shoulder to shoulder and you do something that he likes to do. And let me just throw in, without talking. <laughs> he will love you for life. Just give him a little bit of time where you let him enjoy what he likes. And you're there without a lot of talking. We can talk about more of that later. With your children, spend time doing something that they want to do. And this is tough. My boys love, they only get to play like their game stuff on the weekend. And for a limited amount of time, they love that stuff. And they, oh, mom, come check out what I did. And I'm thinking, I have no clue. Samuel, the other day, he's like, mom, come in and race with me. And I'm like, I have no clue how to work the controller. I don't know how it works. But I'm, I went in and I sat down and I'm trying my best to work that controller. And you know what? He was jazzed about it. So do things that your children like to do. Not all the time, but give them that time. And, of course, with your friends, ladies, you've got to make time to develop girl friends. Letter B, the benefits of cultivating companionship. Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie together... They will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Wow, <laughs> there's so much in this section. Let me just go through a couple of things. He's acknowledging here the importance of friendship and the value of working together. That's that, uh, in this little section, if you had to list four W's, here's what they would be. There is benefits in working together. He says it will be, there will be a good return for their work. There are benefits in walking together. Why do you think they say when you go hiking, go in at least with a pair, with someone else? If something happens to you, you need someone else to help you. There are benefits in walking together. By the way, you can walk further when someone is walking with you. You see it in all the sports, biking, running, swimming. They will swim and they will, they will have alliances and teams because you can go further with two. The third W, there's benefits in warming. Two bodies create more heat. Now, I don't know how you are, but I'm pretty much cold most of the time. I'm kind of praying that, because one of my friends told me when she went through menopause that she never had, like, sweats. She was cold. Like, she just got more cold. I'm like, I hope that's me. I hope that's me. But there are benefits to two bodies being together and being able to warm each other. 
Fourth W, watch care. There are benefits in watch care. If, there, if one could be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And by the way, two is good, but three is better. And that's the idea of the ending of that. I mean, literally, that's what he's saying. If two is good, then three would be even better. And that, that particular part of Scripture is used a lot at wedding ceremonies. And um, Gary Payne, I love it, and he talked about it um, when he preached a few weeks ago, but he does the triangle. And he says, you have God up here, you have your husband here, and you have you here on this side of the triangle. There are three of you. When you make God the center of your marriage, then your marriage will be stronger. And as your husband is pursuing God, and as you are pursuing God separately, you, as you grow closer to God, will grow closer together. And by the way, let me encourage you, if you are further along in your growth towards Christ than you are of your husband, don't get caught up looking down here saying, what about you, buddy? What have you done lately? You need to keep your eyes focused on Christ and let God do the work on your husband and his growth. Three are even better. Letter C, advancement that is meaningful. I don't have time to read it. This is, he's the better the poor but wise youth and the old but foolish king. Let me just give you some things about advancement that we learn here. One, we've got to have proper perspective on advancement. A couple of things I want to point out to you. That position and wealth are no guarantee of success. Here you've got this king, but he was foolish. He was not taking warning. His position was not helping him at that point. Just as much as position and wealth are no guarantee for success, poverty and seeming failure are no barriers to achievement. A poor, wise youth, and it goes on to say, comes from prison to the kingship. Born in poverty, rises to the kingship. So we cannot, we have to have proper perspective. God can advance whoever he wants to advance, no matter the circumstances. God is able. By the way, advancement is fickle, fleeting, and fame is fickle and fleeting. If God has advanced you, understand that he can take it away for his purpose. Just as much as he gives it for his purpose, he can take it away. We cannot count on it. And by the way, verses 15 and 16, really, I love it. I saw all those that lived and walked under the sun, and they were following the king. But then look at 16. There was no end to all the people who were before them, but, love that, those who came later were not pleased with the successor. Which means you're not going to please everybody. Okay, moving on. So what do we need to do? What, I, what do I want to give you for advancement that is meaningful? One, we've got to choose God's wisdom over foolishness. In other words, choose to please God rather than attempting to please people. Secondly, you have been blessed in order to be a blessing. Whatever it is, whatever, however small it is, you have been blessed so that you can be a blessing. What comes to my mind at this moment, some people say, well, my house, my apartment, it's too small to really have people over. Do you realize that so many people in the world don't even have a house that size? Use what God has blessed you with to bless others. Invite people in. Make them a meal. Sit on the floor. The fellowship is what is meaningful, not the space that you have. Thirdly, remember that God advances you to advance his kingdom agenda. And we need to focus on that. Because if we'll focus on the fact that God has placed me where I am, be it in motherhood, be it in Bible fellowship teaching role, whatever it may be, it is for his purposes and his purposes alone. And I need to have that as my focus. God gives us the ability to work, and he gives us the ability to enjoy it when we are balanced. He gives us relationships, and he gives us many benefits of those relationships when we take time to cultivate them. 
Maybe we're sitting here thinking to ourselves, well, I don't, I don't really see that I'm getting a lot of benefits from my working and from my walking and being, finding warmth and compassion. Ask yourself, am I spending time cultivating the relationships that God has given me? And he advances us to advance his kingdom. Here's what I want to say. Time is short. Our life on earth is speeding by. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. We need to look to God to help us make choices. And that leads me to our third truth. God's way is balanced, beneficial, and brings meaning. God's way is balanced, beneficial, and brings meaning. Underline God's way. Because if, if you're anything or can relate to me at all, it would be my likelihood to step out of those two words into Elizabeth's way. What Elizabeth wants to do in the time frame that Elizabeth wants to do it. It's God's way that gives us balance, beneficial, and brings meaning. What about you? Where are you unbalanced in your life? What relationships do you need to take time to cultivate? We need to ask ourselves that. So today we've talked about turning to God. Turning to God because he cycles time. Turning to God because he sees oppression. Turning to God because he gives companionship and he gives advancement. What are you turning to? Is it your friends? Your spouse? Is it the comfort of all the friends lists you have on Facebook? Or whatever one that you're happening to be on. By the way, they're saying that the percentage is astronomical of growth of those ages 35 and over on Facebook. Overtaken teenagers and college age students. What does that say to me? There are a lot of us at this point in our life. We are desperately looking for friendship. And we can be surfacely appeased. By checking out what people are doing on things like that. Beware, ladies. We've got to purposefully turn to God instead of other people and things because God is sovereign and he is in control. Everything that he does endures forever. Nothing can be added and nothing can be taken away. Last week, we had a picture of the cross and I said... Look and search for the cross diligently in your life. This week, I'm saying to you, stand before the cross of Christ in your life and understand that it endures forever. You can add nothing to it and you can take nothing away from it. The cross endures forever. This week, Focus, not only searching for the cross, but understanding it is perfect, it is forever. Our fears, our fears, anything that we fear can t turn to an overflow of abounding love and trust in our Lord. Trust that his timing is perfect because there is a time for everything and a season for every activity. No matter what you are in, you can trust that God makes everything beautiful in its time. Trust his ways. We are not going to understand everything. And there are things that aren't fair. But God is a righteous judge. He will bring before him both the righteous and the wicked. And we can trust. We can trust that God's outcomes are perfect. Because he is purposeful in who he brings into your life. And how he advances you in this life. Two are better than one. God has a purpose for all of that. So we can trust that longing that we feel that no one or nothing can take care of. That eternity that God has set in our heart. The fact that we cannot fathom from beginning to end that and all that God has done. But we can lay claim to what we sang this morning. That we will understand it better by and by. When as saints of God we are gathered home. We will.
tell the story of how we overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Until then, turn to God. Heavenly Father, I praise you. I thank you that your word is rich. And Father, that if we would just trust you, even when we struggle to trust you, that we will turn to you in every aspect of our life. Whether we are laughing or whether we are weeping. And so, Father, I pray this morning that you would take your word, reach in to the depths of each woman, and show her how you desire to bring meaning into her life through the season that she's in, the activity that she is doing, no matter the oppression that she faces, because you have surrounded her with people for a purpose, and you are advancing her for your kingdom's agenda. And may we turn to you with expectant faces that we can lay claim to all that you have promised in your scripture. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen.